Only five verses this week, right? 13 through 17. So this should be a short video then, right? I must not have very much to say about five verses. You know, we'll see. We'll see if we get to 20 minutes or not. There's a lot. A lot. It probably doesn't shock you that I have a lot to say about these five verses. So uh, the story of Jesus calling his tax collector disciple, Matthew, this, of course, is the same Matthew who wrote the Gospel of Matthew. Although our text is not from the Gospel of Matthew, it is from the Gospel of Mark. Just a little bit confusing. Mark is writing about when Matthew became a disciple. Mark, who actually wasn't one of the original 12 disciples, so don't let that throw you either. Mark's story, a um, little bit complicated. We ran into him a little bit in our journey through Acts this year. Young guy who... Uh, Paul was not very fond of, at least uh, at least for a while, a relative of Silas, a good friend of the Apostle Peter, as it turns out. Um, Mark uh, compiled this gospel, and actually Mark's gospel is the one you want to read if you're in a hurry. He doesn't, uh, he doesn't beat around the bush. He gets right to the main points and in and out, which includes this story here, very much the case where we have a, a very rapid development of plot here. So... Um, Oh, one thing you might actually be somewhat confused about is that actually the text, depending on your translation, but um, it actually doesn't say anything about Matthew here, does it? Jesus calls Levi. Oh, wait, I thought this was about Matthew. Who's this Levi guy? Same dude, different name. So um, he worked for the Romans, right? That's what Actually, let's establish what a tax collector was, just so we're clear on this. This is a not an unimportant point. So the Roman Empire took over a whole bunch of land, and of course, being a, a government, they uh, they taxed whoever they were in control over. And actually, they were, as governments go, actually not too bad at using tax money to actually accomplish things. They built a whole lot of roads, aqueducts, yeah, the Colosseum, yeah, things like that. Um, so, in order to get the taxes, though, it was, uh, hey, we're coming up on tax day. I know, actually, Nikki, this would be a, I'm sure this story has a special relevance here for you. Um, so, yeah, they didn't exactly have the same kind of taxing system that we have now where you uh, go to your tax preparer um, or, uh, or try to go to loan and just make sure your, your taxes are postmarked by April 15th or you'll hear from an IRS agent. Well, actually... Their version of the IRS was a lot more hands-on. It had to be. Uh, people who would uh, be responsible for a certain territory. But here's the weird thing about um, how taxes were collected back then. The Romans demanded a certain amount, and then after that, the tax collector could charge a little bit more for his salary. Now, the tax collectors were drawn from the population of the people that Rome was occupying. So they conquer Palestine, and they're in charge of the Jews now. They're there in control of the Jews. So they get Jewish people to be their tax collectors. Now, this doesn't sit well in most places, but especially among the Jews. For a Jewish person to be in cahoots with the Roman government, not, um, not a good sign, not, not a good show. And so... The, uh, the tax collectors who go to work for Rome are already persona non grata, to use a, a Latin term, which they would have been familiar with. So these, these tax collectors are, are, are not the most popular people in town by any means, just because they work for the Roman government. They're collaborators with this, this empire that's conquered you. And now back to how they get their money. They're allowed to charge a little bit beyond what the, uh, whatever the fee that Rome is demanding, they're allowed to charge a little bit more. But if they happen to mark that up a little bit, there's really nothing that the people can do. This is a really bad system, which is just absolutely kind of set up for corruption. So I'm a tax collector. Everybody hates me. And I can charge anything I want for taxes and keep all the extra for myself. Well, if everybody hates me to begin with, what motivation do I have in order to uh, in order to actually treat people fairly. I don't. So I might as well, as long as they're going to hate me anyway, I might as well take them for everything I can. Which, do you think that's going to make them hate you more or less? It's just really a vicious cycle here. You charge, and 
and people hate you even more, which makes me want to keep charging them even more. And it just is just this vicious cycle. You do get rich. The tax collectors did have a whole bunch of money. Um, is that consolation, though? Does that make up for the fact that everybody hates you and your life is miserable otherwise? Really, the only peer group you have at this point are the other tax collectors, right? They're the only... <laughs> so these tax collectors all kind of hang out together because, like, everybody else hates them. They're the, the outcasts of society. Rich outcasts, but outcasts nonetheless. <clears throat> so that's the situation with tax collectors. And also the, the double name then comes in because the Romans couldn't be bothered to call people by their proper Hebrew names. And so they would have a different name, a more Roman name. So Levi was this fellow's Hebrew name. That's what his mom and dad named him. They named him Levi after Levi, the son of Jacob, one of the 12 sons of Jacob. Um, and so he's, he's uh, Levi to the Hebrews, but the Romans call him Matthew. And when he writes his gospel, I guess that largely goes to a Gentile audience, so they keep the name Matthew. Although I, I, I would presume that the other 12 disciples would just call him Levi, that they would have known him as Levi. Anyway, uh, this actually, another guy who has this kind of situation is Paul. Uh, we talked about this briefly in the book of Acts. A lot of people think Saul changed his name to Paul after he became a Christian. This is actually not the case. He always was Paul and Saul at the same time, depending on who he was talking to. Saul was his Hebrew name, named after King Saul, the first king of Israel. And Paul was his Roman name. That's what the Romans, the Gentiles, would call him. So when we first meet him in the book of Acts, Luke calls him Saul because he's dealing, he's, he's working for the Jewish authorities. He's going to Damascus to arrest Christians to bring them back to Jerusalem. But then as our story goes on and he becomes this great evangelist to the Gentiles, we might as well call him Paul. That's his name that he's known by in the provinces. So kind of an aside. Point is, Matthew and Levi, same dude, different names. All right. So he's sitting at his tax booth one day, and Jesus comes by and says, follow me. And yeah, did I mention this is a rapid story? Bam. He leaves his money behind. This is actually pretty stunning. We had a story a couple of weeks ago where the fishermen just kind of left their boats and left their fish. The sons of Zebedee just left their dad in the boat to come and follow Jesus. This is even more stunning in some ways because Matthew is leaving behind a whole lot of money. He's sitting at the tax booth. Jesus says, follow me. Matthew or Levi, he rises and follows Jesus, leaving the money behind. So talk about a new identity here. He is completely changing his entire life, leaving his wealth that used to define him in many ways. And now he is a disciple of Jesus. Follow me, says Jesus. The call we, again, we saw this a couple of weeks ago with the fishermen. It's Jesus who issues the call. He takes the initiative. His word is spoken. And then we do have the ability to reject that spoken word, but Matthew is, does not. He does not reject the call. He instead leaves his old identity and begins a new life with Christ. A life that will have some great ups and downs, some great adventures, ultimately will end with him being martyred. Oh, well, no, that's not the end. It will ultimately end with him being raised from the dead on the last day and living a life eternal in the new kingdom. But until then, he's going to have some ups and downs. Um, interestingly, his, it begins then, um, verse 15, his new life with Jesus begins with a meal. He sits down with Jesus along with other tax collectors and sinners. So these are the outcasts. These are the people who nobody wants to be friends with, and they're sitting together with Jesus. He sits and eats with them. You may have heard me talk about table fellowship before. This is a really important principle in first century Palestine. The Gospel of Luke really plays this up, it's, but we can see it a little bit here. To eat with somebody in the first century con conveyed similar status. So if you eat with somebody, this means you, you and I are on the same level and I accept you and we're, we're together. So people would not eat, they would not mix Jews and Gentiles. Jews would not eat with Gentiles because you know, they, they didn't consider Gentiles to be in the same class as them because they weren't God's chosen people like they were. Uh, rich people would not eat with poor people. This was actually a problem in Corinth and then later when Paul would write to the Corinthians and 
he'd be like, yeah, that thing you're doing with the Lord's Supper where the poor people are serving the rich people, that's not how we do the Lord's Supper in our church. So, um, yeah, rich people eat with rich people. Poor people eat with poor people. Righteous people eat with righteous people. If you consider yourself a good person and you eat with somebody who society knows is not a good person, like someone who works for the Romans, somebody who cheats other people out of money, prostitutes, you know, the, the public sinners, and you eat with them, this actually means that you're accepting them. You're conveying to them a level of social acceptance. You're saying, I'm on the same level as you. So it just is not done. So one of the most scandalous things Jesus does in his ministry, and he does this all the time, is when he sits down and eats with sinners. So he doesn't sin, but it's really a scandalous thing when people see him eating with sinners. It's like, I'm on the same level as a sinner. <laughs> Guess what? That's what Jesus came to do, to be on the same level as sinners, ultimately to die in place of sinners. And even though he wasn't a sinner, he got dirty with the sinners. He sat down and, and ate with them and took on their sin and ultimately suffered the consequences for being with sinners. Part of those consequences, though, was the rejection of the Pharisees who said, how can this guy possibly be the Messiah if he's eating with sinners? And Jesus gives a really trenchant answer again. Leave it to Mark to cut right to the core of it. Hey, I'm not here to help healthy people like you. Now, there's some irony here because, of course, the Pharisees really actually are not so healthy themselves. But Jesus is like, I'm here to help sick people. I'm here for sinners. And this is good news for all of us who realize that we're sinners. Any who are thinking that they um, that they are not sinners and that they don't need the help of God, Jesus says, I don't have to come and eat with you. Uh, you're, you're good. You go on going about your business. But, uh, of course, there are ways Jesus tries to alert the Pharisees to the fact that they're not so good and that they actually need, need help, too. But in any event, Jesus um, gives us his mission. So he calls a disciple, and then his disciple is from a, a group of sinners. But he lets us know that these are the people he wants as disciples. Sinners who, who are interested in leaving behind their life of sin, uh, but sinners nonetheless. So that's, that's who Jesus is making into his disciples. All right. Well, let's talk about the things we talk about every week. What does the story tell us about God and his mercies? It tells us that we have a God who self-selects sinners, who chooses people who are not righteous in order to welcome into his kingdom. He makes them righteous by eating with them. <clears throat> he makes them righteous by taking away their sin and giving them that invitation to, to come into his kingdom. What does the story tell us about who we are and our identity? Well, whatever our name is, no matter if we change our name to live in a different country or what, uh, we are God's people and his disciples. And we that means that we leave behind the tables of money sometimes. Our identity is located in Christ. And sometimes that can be a, a situation that leads to some very difficult decisions. To leave behind our money tables is not always an easy thing to do. But this is who we are. We are disciples of Christ. And this means that there are certain things in, our, in this world that are incompatible with being a disciple of Christ. And if need be, if we have to make a choice, we'll leave behind wealth. We'll leave behind uh, material possessions. We'll even leave behind other people if that's what we have to do. We want to be loving and accepting. We want to eat with others who are not like us. But um, if we have to choose, we're always going to follow Jesus. Maybe a more likely scenario is that other people reject us uh, because of our decision to um, not leave, not keep sitting at the money table. So anyway, um, so following Jesus leads to societal rejection, but it also leads to citizenship in the kingdom of heaven, <laughs> at least for some, <clears throat> perhaps many. What does the story tell us? Application, <clears throat> well, I, I mean, it tells us that we are to love everybody, regardless of sin. We don't condone sin, but our calling is to actually put ourselves on the level of sinners, because maybe it's a little easier for us than uh, ostensibly for Jesus, because we actually are sinners. So even if we sin differently than others, you know, we don't look down on other sinners just because they're sinners, because, I mean, they're like us too. So we come to their level, we'll, we'll eat with anybody and share the love of Jesus with anybody. 
And also, I mean, there's an application here. Anytime you talk about eating, the Lord's Supper comes to mind. This is how Jesus comes and has a meal with us. Actually gives him of gives us of himself, gives gives himself as our meal so that we may have the righteousness that he has in his body given to us in our bodies. So uh, another application here is come to the Lord's Supper and receive the meal that Jesus has prepared for sinners. There probably is more than I can say, but yeah, it's pretty good. 15 minutes for five verses. If you have any more questions, I'd be glad to talk some more. Email me, text me, any other questions, but uh, that should be pretty good for this week. God bless you as you can continue to make disciples at Zion.